Hi, and welcome to my task about our paper, A Review and Refinement of Surprise Adequacy. We're first going to look at surprise adequacy, not surprisingly. Um, that's the metric the, the, the talk is all about. We're going to discuss how surprise adequacy is used in the practice. We'll then target the primary weakness of surprise adequacy, which is that it's rather slow, and we show how you can make it faster. And then lastly, we look at training instability. Uh, that's an issue I identified as part of our experiments, um, and we want to uh, show it to you a little more in detail. Good. So let's start by looking at what surprise adequacy actually does. So. Surprise adequacy aims to detect inputs which are surprising with respect to the uh, to the data set observed during training. Um, and we can say that an input is surprising if it leads to an inner state of the neural network, which is not well represented in the training set. It, this metric has first been proposed by Kim and his colleagues two years ago uh, at ICSI. And it has now been used in, in a vast variety of different papers. It's been cited 113 times when I took this print screen. That's already a bit of time ago. So by now, it's, it's definitely more. So let's look into the core idea of surprise adequacy. We have a fast forward neural network consisting of a couple of layers, right? An input layer and an output layer. And in between, we have the hidden layers, which take activations for any given inputs. Now, surprise adequacy works on those hidden layers. Often, and also in our case, one layer is selected. And from these layers, the activations uh, of the nodes for a given input are extracted. And we call them, for the remainder of this talk, activation trays. Now, what does surprise adequacy do with those activation traces? Actually, it collects all the activation traces from the training set after training has been completed and uses them to distinguish whether a new data set is out of distribution with respect to those data point, uh, data activation traces observed on the training set. If we look at the activation trace observed in the training set, we can see that they're often very well clustered. That's not a proposition by surprise adequacy. That's something which is known in the literature for, for quite a while. Um, but surprise adequacy actually uses this by saying like, hey, if we have a point which is in the middle of the cluster um, of a, a point with a prediction like class A, and it's in the middle of the, predict, uh, of, of the data points for class A, then it has a low surprise. If on the other hand, a point has prediction class A and it's very far away from the class A cluster, then it's highly surprising. Now, this is the general idea. This is the goal behind surprise adequacy. And actually, the original paper proposes two ways on how these high and low surprise can be quantified. The first one is by using a kernel density-based estimation. So here, again, if we have a point which is in the middle of the cluster, it has a low surprise. If it's outside of the cluster, it has high surprise. And this is by da done by simply estimating the likelihood with respect to the distribution of the points of the predicted class. Next, they propose distance-based surprise adequacy. In distance-based surprise adequacy, here you can see the formula for a input observed for an activation trace observed during prediction time, you measure the distance to the, close, to the closest point of the prediction class, and then the distance from that point to its closest point from another class. Um, and then you take the division between them, and you can easily see if the closest class point kind of is, is, is very close, at the same class point is very close, and then the distance to the other class point is very large. You have a low surprise, and the other way around, you have a high surprise. Now, now we wanted to know, does it actually work, right? It's been used in the literature very often, um, but we wanted to see, are the claims actually backed up? So we tested how good out of distribution is performed by surprise adequacy, out of distribution detection. We trained MNIST, an MNIST classifier using the nominal MNIST training data. And then we saw how well surprise adequacy was able to distinguish corrupted and adversarial samples from 
the nominal samples. And actually, it's very capable of doing that. We'll see specific numbers a bit later. Um, but this is already essentially confirming the results of the original paper to their research question one. Okay, so now that we know how surprise adequacy works and that it works, let's see how it is used. And for that extent, we looked at the 105 citations of surprise adequacy according to Google Scholar at the time of uh, the submission of this paper, uh, of our paper. Uh, we found that 22 of the citations were invalid. Um, 66 did mention the original paper about surprise adequacy, but not actually use it. But then there were 15 papers which were actually using, so actively using surprise adequacy, which is an impressive number given that the paper has just been published two years ago. Um, and we further divide those 15 papers into six papers, which use surprise adequacy as a baseline metric for their approach. Mention, worth mentioning that surprise adequacy has multiple different use cases, right? So in my talk now, I focus on out of distribution detection, but as the name suggests, it can, for example, also be used uh, for for as, as an adequacy criteria, for example. Um, so it, it can be used for a vast variety of approaches as a baseline metric. Then it's sometimes also used to validate existing approaches. For example, as an adequacy criteria, right? It can be used to validate testing approaches. And then last, it's also been part of proposed approaches, so approaches which, which base their contribution on surprise adequacy by either improving or including surprise adequacy as part of their approach. Okay, so we know that surprise adequacy works. We know that surprise adequacy is used. But we unfortunately have the problem that surprise, surprise adequacy is quite slow, and now we want to make it faster. It's worth mentioning that the original implementation of surprise adequacy is open source available, permissive MIT license very well. However, this code is not performance optimized, right? It's a reproduction package of the first initial proposition of surprise adequacy, and not intended for like very fast surprise adequacy calculation. And this can lead to a problem. And the problem is particularly uh, evident in the case of DSA, where we have to calculate a lot of differences, first from an observed point to the points with the same predicted class, right? And then to points from the other classes. Uh, and this takes a lot of time. That's a lot of distances to, to calculate. Now, how can we make this faster? We propose four steps, or we implemented four steps to make this calculation faster. First of all, we use vectorized NumPy op op operations. So instead of using Python for loops, we actually perform operations on the entire vector at the same time in the fast C implementations provided by NumPy. Then we use multi-threading to further speed up, right? So this distance calculation, the distance to one point is independent from the distance to the other point, so we can calculate them concurrently. Um, we only use a one-shot prediction of the neural network. This means that while the original implementation makes two predictions for the same input, one to get the predicted class and one to get the activation trace, we only predict once and we observe the activation trace while we, predict, uh, while, while we predict the class. And then lastly, we separate the code into stuff that can be done offline and then can be cached, such as the fitting of KDE in LSA, for example, and the online stuff. So everything that is dependent on the input for which we want to quantify the surprise. All these four steps together allowed us to come up with a much faster implementation. Um, so here's a couple of benchmarks, a couple of, of metric, uh, measurements that we took on a MacBook Pro and then a very fast desktop PC with a good CPU and two GPUs. Well, on the MacBook Pro, we can see we can heavily improve the, the time, for in, in particular for DSA, right, where the original prediction takes almost five minutes. If we improve it um, using the... the the vectorized NumPy operations uh, using the uh, using using the other things that we implemented, 
um, we get down to 24 seconds. And then if we also enable multi-threading, we, we push it further down to 13 seconds. This step here is not big anymore because yeah, MacBook Pro doesn't have that many cores. However, if we jump on the desktop PC, we can see that the time from 212 actually is reduced down to four seconds. So this really makes it very fast. Um, here it's worth mentioning that we tested our implementation against the original implementation. They are consistent, um, so they really implement the same algorithm. Um, even more so, our implementation is actually not completely from scratch, but it is built on the original implementation and just changes these things required to make it faster. Okay, however, we still have the problem that in particular DSA is it's, it's computationally intensive, right? We have to calculate the distance to all the point in the training set. And uh, so this is, this is a linear effort, right? And in deep learning, we can have enormously big training sets. So calculating these differences to every training sample very quickly can become infeasible in practice. So now how can we target this? And we propose four sampling strategies that we say like, hey, we only measure the distances to a subset of the activation traces from the training set. And then because there's likely to be duplicates or redundancies in the training set, hopefully we get similarly good out of distribution scores. And the first strategy that we implemented for this is, is the naive one, it's uniform sampling, right? So we just sample from our training set per class uniformly at random to get a smaller data set of activation traces. Then next, we check neighbor-free sampling. In neighbor-free sampling, we, which is only for DSA, right? We, we know that, hey, DSA, if there's two activation traces which are equivalent or almost equivalent, they're almost the same, then measuring the distance to both of them is not going to improve surprise at the ecosy in any case. So we can safely discard one of them. Hence, neighbor-free sampling is a sampling approach where we, from the entire training set, just start by discarding the inputs or the activation traces for a given class, which are closest from each other, right? Such that in the end, our, our data sets, it's far less scarce, but in expectation, still good, should still give us similar uh, results. And then lastly, we tested unsurprising first sampling. This actually targets a potential weakness of DSA, namely that it, it, it might be suspicable, or it, it, it might be, uh, it, it might not answer well if we have noise in the data set, right? So assume that we have in the data set, in the training data set, we have points out here, right? Clearly, they should be surprising. They're, they're, they're not really following the distribution. However, using DSA, if we now get a, a sample point, an input for which we have to calculate the surprise, which is very close to one of those points, it will likely result in a very, very low surprise, even though it's clearly out of the distribution. And we say like, hey, this might be, a, we might be able to fix this by discarding the unsurprising samples for, um, by, by keeping the unsurprising samples, right? And we discard the surprising ones first. So the ones out here, which are surprising, we don't include them to calculate the actual surprise for an unseen input. Now we measured the impact of all those three sampling strategies on our data set. And we actually get very promising results. For LSA, um, we find that if we use about half of the data set, the prediction is almost equally well than if we use the first data set. This is already an encouraging um, finding. By the way, our results here also confirm that LSA typically performs a bit less than DSA, which is already mentioned when uh, surprise decency was first proposed. But now our results get really interesting when we use to the slow DSA, right? So we find that for both uniform sampling and for neighbor-free sampling, if we use as little as one third of the training data, act uh, activation traces, to calculate the surprise, hence making surprise equal calculation two thirds faster, we actually essentially get the same 
how CROC in terms of out of distribution detection. So this is really very, very, very encouraging. If we use surprise decency in the loop as part of our testing approach, this can change from, from an infeasible amount to, uh, of work to an actually very much feasible amount of work, right? And the same goes for unsurprising first sampling where the results are also encouraging although not quite as much. Here, it, it looks like we're discarding the wrong images, right? So we are the wrong activation traces. We're worse than the uniform sampling. However, MNIST has almost no noise in this set, data set. So it's, it's, it's up for further questioning whether this looks better in a, with the noisy trading data set. Okay. So, while conducting these experiments, uh, we found that surprise adequacy is actually unstable um, with respect to, uh, it's very sensitive to random influences in the training process. So when we train a neural network, we have random initial weights, we have random influences part of the regularization, for example, and they have an influences on the activations and hence on surprise adequacy. And actually this influence can be quite large. We ran, uh, surprise adequacy multiple times. I think we ran the experiments 20 times and we we found that in particular for LSA, the range between the lowest uh, observed outcrocks and the highest observed outcrocks here can be very, very high, right? So we observe differences from 0 0.88 to 0 0.96, which in an empirical study can really be the difference between being a very good approach to being the worst of the tested approaches, right? And this is something that we have to take care of. So as of now, our results suggest that if you use surprise frequency, you should actually repeat your experiments multiple times and average the results to get a statistically significant finding, right? Um, we also look at the bandwidth factor for LSA, which is kind of a very important hyperparameter. Uh, and we was assuming that this hyperparameter could be used to influence the sensitivity. And indeed, as shown here, we find that different selection of, of bandwidth factors has a high influence on both the out of distribution detection capabilities of LSA, but also on the sensitivity, hence of the distribution of the out of distribution scores, right? Um, here, what we find, however, is it's a very positive finding that if we use the rule of thumbs, Scott rules or Silverman rules, which are essentially defaults when using KDE, we appear to be very close, if not on the optimal solution. Good. So now that was an overview of our paper. Let's quickly summarize what we did. We looked at 105 different papers citing surprise adequacy. We found that 15 of them actually use surprise adequacy which definitely shows the high importance of surprise adequacy for the research domain. Then we targeted the main weaknesses of LSA and DSA, namely that they're slow, by providing much faster implementations. We further increase runtime by showing that if we just use a subset of the data set, we can further, in, uh, further make it much faster and hardly use any, any out of distribution detection capability. And then lastly, we had a brief look at the problem we identified of training instability, um, a problem which may actually have a big influence on further research using surprise DPC. This directly leads us to the future work. So LSA and DSA are not the only variants of surprise adequacy anymore. By now, there's Malinovis-based surprise adequacy, yet another variant, which also targets um, the slow runtime, right? So it's much faster. We want to see how well this compares in particular to our sampling-based approaches. We want to test more case studies. So far, it's only MNIST. If we get to more challenging data sets, we may actually find different results. And then lastly, we want to get a better understanding of this training instability. We want to see which hyperparameters are particularly under interesting for training instability. And we want to investigate for different data sets, how many rerunnings of the experiments we need to get statistically stable results. Good. So that's uh, all of today. As a last remark, let me just mention
that Ridi is looking for a PhD position. Ridi uh, is an author, a co-author of this paper. Uh, he contributed heavily to the results I just presented. He's going to finish his master in a couple of weeks. So if you're looking for a master student interesting in machine learning, uh, I would recommend you to drop him an email. And I think that's it. Thanks for listening.